So welcome everybody again. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Brennan today. Jason is the Flanagan Family Professor of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at Georgetown University. He is the editor of Public Affairs Quarterly and an associate editor of Social Philosophy and Policy. He is the author of 16 books and his books have been translated 30 times. I highly recommend, by the way, Markets Without Limits. The German translation of Against Democracy was a Der Spiegel bestseller. He has published over 50 articles in peer-reviewed journals and over 30 peer-reviewed chapters. Today, he's here to talk about the ethics of legacy admissions. Welcome, Jason. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm going to have a, I want to use a PowerPoint because I have some graphs and things to show. Yeah. This is going to be kind of a, a different talk in that, you know, oftentimes when you're giving a talk like this, it's like you got a seminar paper and you're trying to like go through it. But this is actually meant to be more of a discussion with other faculty like you. So uh, the reason that I've been invited me to do this and thanks for having me do it is, you know, he people just rail against legacy admissions all the time. And in the book, Markers of Limits, I like a brief excerpt where we briefly say, well, what could be said in their defense? And today I'm going to make kind of a half-hearted defense of legacy admissions. I'm not sure if this is actually right. If you tell me, if you prove to me I'm wrong, I'll walk away happy from that. But I think that there is something to be said for it. And in order to defend them, though, we're going to have to be realistically cynical about what universities are doing. Once we sort of see what universities are selling, then we're going to see that, well, a lot of the complaints start to go away. Um, however, in order to defend legacy admissions, what I have to do is critique universities quite a bit and critique the students and the rest of us who are in them. So uh, I'll go through the argument pretty quickly. Um, and then like at the end, we can talk about argue, other arguments for and against. And I'm really, I do want this just to be kind of a discussion. This is not like, you know, chapter five of a new book and I need I need it to get in with Princeton or something. All right, with that said, here you go. Here's like two, the most two argu common arguments you hear for and against legacy admissions out in the news media or in academic literature. The argument that you get against is very simple. Colleges say that they are going to admit people on the basis of merit. They don't have to do that. They could just, you could just have a college that says, we're going to admit people who pay the most, or we're going to admit people on the basis of like religious affiliation or something. But most of the major universities we think of and the places that we work say that they admit on merit. So if you make a public representation that that's your stance, that gives you at least some sort of presumptive obligation to stick by it. Legacy status on this argument is not a form of merit. So legacy admissions are wrong. Maybe that's not a very good argument, but that's the argument you see. There's also an argument you see on behalf of legacy admissions. Even people like Michael Sandel, who hates commodification, except when he's getting paid to talk, uh, even he says uses this argument and says it's pretty persuasive. He's like, well, you know, legacy admissions greatly increase donations. It means that more people are giving more money to universities. And that means these universities have more cash to allow lower income students to go there for free or at reduced price. Uh, to build facilities and things like that. So in a way, you can kind of say to people, sure, some of you didn't get in here because we let in legacies, but for those who do get in, their experience is going to be a lot better because legacy students are paying and their families are paying a lot more money to these universities, which are making the universities better, better faculty, better facilities, but even better students elsewhere. So it's kind of a devil's bargain. We uh, we break the meritocracy to some degree in order to make the remaining meritocracy even better and the quality even better. I don't know if that's right, because um, I'm going to make a different kind of argument that's much more cynical, but also more realistic, I think. I think the main thing that universities sell to students, I'm not talking about what we do, but what students want and what they sell to students are status and mores, attitudes and culture, not education. That's what students are there for, and that's what they want to buy, especially at the kinds of places that like a lot of us are working at, like especially a place like Stanford, or especially at a place like Harvard or Princeton or Georgetown or Penn or they're kind of like peer institutions like that. That's what students want. The other thing that, that the universities are selling to students are the student and alumni body, right? Networking events and the people they're going to interact with when they're at school. A great deal of what students want from a university is a credential that has status and to interact with other students while they're there. And both of these things I think are gonna count in favor of biasing uh, uh, admissions to some degree towards legacy students. So if, and basically I'm going to also say like, if we're against legacy admissions, we're going to have to be against a lot of other pretty common uh, practices that universities engage in when they're deciding who to let in. So, so one sort of open and dirty oh, secret. Wait, hold on here. Of, uh, Do you guys hear my voice? All right. So apparently uh, I have like a, I think I made like a recording of this slide at one point for like a Zoom thing or something. So there's like my narrating on it. All right. So anyways, if you don't, I'll just turn that off. 
Uh, an interesting thing is that when you look at the data, you often see stuff like this. Oh, as a matter of fact, like legacy students at different universities have a higher acceptance rate in any given year. Um, a typical, say, student who's applying to Brown who isn't a legacy student might have a 4% acceptance rate at this year. But if they are a legacy student, they might have more like a 20% acceptance rate. The problem with numbers like this is that it doesn't really tell us much yet. Because if you think about all legacy students as a demographic body and just compare that to all students as a whole, you'd probably expect that on average, legacy students are going to be more competitive just on objective measures or what like other measures than students as a whole. Uh, if you have, if you're the children, uh, like, you know, you've got, you're both your parents went to Princeton, you're probably were brought up a certain way, you developed a lot of social capital, you were education was prioritized, it's IQ, your IQ is probably likely to be higher than the average student, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So just comparing all legacy students to all students, you're already having all these complicating factors that aren't being factored out, we need to like check for that kind of thing. Right. Because I would just expect that, you know, on average, the kids whose both parents went to Princeton are going to be more impressive than just any random person applying to Princeton. Uh, so the bias that we see doesn't yet show that there is a bias in favor of legacy students. It could be that legacy students are, in fact, more impressive on other meritocratic grounds. And that's why they get in higher. We also may have to worry about selection effects. Um, maybe because my parents went to Princeton, I more want, I want to go to Princeton over Harvard. And so like there's, you get more applicants who have a certain kind of strength picking the universities for this, even if they didn't expect there to be a bias in favor of them. So you have to check for that stuff. However, when you do check for it, you still get, you still get actual bias. And one way to look at that is to look at say students who apply to Ivy league schools and their parents are legacy and they are legacies at a particular Ivy league school you are more likely to be accepted by the school at which you're a legacy than you are to schools where you're not a legacy, even though your quality is the same and they're roughly peers. So, you know, if you're good enough to get into Harvard, you're good enough to get into Yale. But if your parents went to Yale and not Harvard, you're much more likely to get into Yale than to Harvard. Uh, so we can start. And so we look at people who actually have been admitted and see, in fact, the people who get admitted uh, are getting admitted at a higher rate when their parents are legacies. Now, even then, that doesn't necessarily mean it's like the legacy bias in the negative sense. It could be the kind of thing where schools are concerned about stuff like uh, the acceptance, like matriculation rates. You know, they have a bias to try to make sure that they only admit students who will say yes. You know, when I was working at Brown, the admissions officers there flat out told us, like they said it to my face, that when they interview people, one of the things they're trying to do is figure out if they offer this person an admission spot, will they say yes? So if one person will and the other person won't, they won't give it to the one who say won't because they want to look good in the US News and World Reports. We also see things like higher income legacy students with equal test scores are admitted at a higher rate than others. But even then, that's probably, it's confounded by all sorts of bias because in general, higher income people also have better test scores and better grades. So probably there is a genuine bias in favor of selecting um, legacy students that's not simply a quality-based bias. However, the numbers that you see thrown out online and by people who complain about this are not carefully controlled. They're not the kinds of things we could put in econ journals because they're just not good enough. They don't, they don't control for selection in some way. So that, okay, good enough. Let's take a step back though and ask, what is the product the universities are selling? Why are students applying to different colleges? What do they want? And what does that have to do with the legacy admissions? So with that, I'm going to do some university bashing and I'll bash my own and then I'll bash everyone else's as I go. Um, I do, the, I teach a first year seminar most years. I don't this year, I'm on sabbatical next semester, but most, most years I teach a uh, first year seminar. And um, one thing I like to do with students is give them a quiz early on in class, maybe the second or third week. I walk in, I give them a short five minute quiz with five questions, which I've taken from what are considered sophomore level, level one, so not honors or AP, but like level one guidebooks for teaching in the US. Almost all of my students took these classes years ago. They got A's in them. Um, they knew this stuff back in the day. This is stuff that they would have considered easy. And I tell them, you have five minutes and if any one of you gets all five questions right, I'm gonna give you $50 on the spot. I used to actually bring in a pile of cash and now I just tell them I'm gonna use Venmo. Uh, I've done this with hundreds of students over the past decade. I have never paid a single dollar. The best any student has ever done is four out of five questions. Usually they get the math questions right and they forget everything else. And a lot of them get the math questions wrong. The typical modal student gets um, two out of five. And like that's probably the, the median and the mean as well. 
Like they don't do that well. And then I always make a joke like, hey, I've just revealed that you don't know what you claimed, you know, should we call the admissions office and get you kicked off campus? Like apparently your high school misrepresented your level of knowledge. So what's really going on here is, you know, these are smart students on average, they've got, and I think their average SAT score is like about a 1510 right now. They ace these questions long ago, but they don't know anything now. They forgot them all. Why not? Well, you know, economics applied to information has a very basic and simple prediction. It's that people will tend to acquire and retain information if and only if the expected benefits exceed the expected costs. Otherwise, they'll rationally forget it or they'll rationally remain ignorant of it. And the benefits could include things like how much you enjoy the information. So, for instance, uh, I learned French for the hell of it. I'm not that great at it, but over the pandemic, I just thought it'd be fun to learn French. So I did, but it's been completely useless to me. It hasn't like, I didn't need it. Even, even I wrote a couple articles in French, but even then I didn't need to do it. Someone else would have done like and translated it for me. Um, I know all sorts of information about sports because it's fun. Uh, I know a lot of information about guitars. I'm never going to buy because I think it's interesting. Um, but then there are things that are useful. Like at, at Georgetown, even though I've been there, this is my 13th year. I only know the name of like four buildings because it never comes up. But when I was a freshman in college, I knew the name of all the buildings because I went to all of them. Um, I know my wife's phone number off the top of my head, but you'll be pleased to know I don't know the numbers of any of your spouses off the top of my head. It hasn't been useful. This explains things why, like in the United States, um, where mo you can drive 3,000 miles in any, one, any direction and not encounter anyone who doesn't speak English or where you don't need English, native English speakers tend not to bother become fluent in a foreign language, but in Europe, it becomes really valuable for you to learn a foreign language, right? It explains things like why I was a chemistry major as an undergraduate. So when you met me at age 20, I knew how to synthesize all sorts of drugs, but now I know hardly anything about chemistry. I've forgotten it all. I don't even know what a ketone is anymore. It's something about oxygen or something, right? So economics of information. All right. So that seems to explain this. Uh, students let themselves forget because this information isn't useful to them anymore. I think this is a problem in general, and this is bearing on what students are buying. First of all, I want to argue that students really don't care that much about education. It's not their main uh, argument. Uh, it's not their main reason that they're going to school. And they're, instead, that they're mostly there for credential status and to interact with the student body. Now, universities don't advertise this, of course. When you look at how universities advertise themselves, they say this highfalutin bullshit, like education your way, success, tradition, real transformation begins here. You know, Georgetown says we help students grow intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally. We encourage them to be thoughtful and caring members of society who contribute to the greater good. Uh, Yale says it's committed to the idea of liberal arts education that frees your mind to the fullest potential. It gains you the ability to think critically and to write, reason, and communicate clearly. And that's the foundation of all professions. Smith College, which is in the middle of nowhere, Massachusetts, says that it is a gatekeeper to the world. And if you go to Smith, the world is at your fingertips, even though in reality, you're in the middle of nowhere and it takes you like two hours to get to a good airport where you can go see the world. Uh, nevertheless, the world is at your fingertips at Smith. These are some fancy schools, but even not so fancy schools say this stuff. So Northward University says leadership isn't taught, it's instilled. It will transform you personally, and professionally. And they go and say every single interaction you have with other students or faculty will be transformative. Literally every single one. That's amazing. Uh, Arizona State says that their liberal arts and science education will transform you into socially aware, critically thinking global citizen. Uh, Louisiana State defends its um, philosophy program by saying that it has superior results in the GRE and the LSAT and so on. All right. That's what they say. Is any of it true? That's how they advertise themselves. Is it true? How would we know? They don't go and check. How would we know? Well, already we have a worry here because there's selection versus treatment effects. The kinds of people who get into Stanford are already super impressive the day that they walk in. You guys don't just let any old schmuck in. You're not like, hey, you got like a, a 950 on the SAT and he had a C average in high school and you didn't do a single extracurricular. Don't worry. We believe so strongly in Stanford education that we can take someone like you and turn you into Nobel laureate scientist. You don't. You only admit the very, very best who are super impressive on paper, right? You know, we try to do the same. Others do something similar. So already we know the students on the day that they start look pretty good and have superior skills. The fact that they're willing to apply to college in the first place tells us they have a certain level of conscientiousness. The fact that you have the wherewithal to finish college, regardless of whether you learn anything in college, shows you have superior conscientiousness. So we can't just compare college grads to non-college grads to ask what college is doing. We have to compare like to like and control for these things. So of course, say, 
graduates from Harvard are more impressive than graduates from Steen, uh, King State College uh, in New Hampshire, which is like, you know, that's where like the C students from my high school went um, because they're just much more selective. And of course, who finishes is going to be more impressive than who gets in, who's going to be more impressive than who applies, who's going to be more impressive than just the regular old high school student. We have to control for all these things. I actually, by the way, as an aside, I think this is actually quite unethical that universities advertise themselves this way. And I want to argue that by analogy to what, imagine a drug company did this. So imagine that Pfizer came up with a drug called Calegra, and they advertise it like this. They go, Calegra is a drug unlike any other. If you take it for 25 times a year for four years, it will improve your reasoning, moral reasoning, analytic and quantitative skills. It'll make you have a global mindset. It'll make you face any challenge. It'll prepare you for any job and grammatically increase your cognitive skills. It will make you score higher in standardized tests and the LSAT and the GMAT. It'll also make you more money. You can expect to make an additional million, 1.5 million over the course of your lifetime if you take our drug. Mm -hmm. Um, by the way, the cost of the drug is going to vary from person to person. If you're rich, we're going to charge you $280,000. But if you're poor, we might charge you nothing. Um, we have some very satisfied former users who are willing to help pay for your use of the drug. By the way, uh, you can't work a full-time job while taking this drug. And it has a bunch of side effects like the tendency to get, I don't know, uh, certain, certain venereal diseases and to engage in binge drinking and to have a lot of debt at the end, right? Imagine Pfizer executives sincerely believed everything they said. They, they're not lying. They're not bullshitting us. They actually believe it's true, but they never test the drug and they have no plans to test the drug. And even worse, a bunch of other people for scholarly reasons have tested the drug and they claim it doesn't work. Well, in that case, you'd think this is a pretty unethical company. They would get in trouble with the FDA. Lawyers would sue them and they lose a bunch of money. But that's actually what universities are doing. Universities make this advertisement to students these are the side effects and the costs. And in fact, this is true of what universities do. They believe what they say. They don't test the claims that they make. They have no plans to start testing them. And a bunch of people have independently done research testing their claims and falsified those claims, right? So what do I mean by that? Well, already we know all these worries about selection effects. So for instance, my uh, philosophy colleagues love to talk about how well philosophers do on the, uh, at the GRE. Like philosophers get the best score on the verbal section and the best score on the analytic section. And they get the best uh, math score of anyone who isn't like a real math major. And they do better even than some of the like engineers and others. Obviously, philosophy is making you like much smarter. And it's like, maybe, but we have selection effects because it turns out that if you look at people who intend to be philosophy majors as high school students and you look at their SAT scores, they're really, really high. And then they get to school and they start taking philosophy classes and the dumber ones get weeded out. So it could be that philosophy is doing nothing for them. It could be making them worse, but we have selection effects. No one has ever written a paper controlling for that to try to test to see what it actually adds. We have evidence of signaling because of things like the sheepskin effect, uh, you know, if you if you quit college like a month before you graduate, your expected lifetime wages are the same as if you never went to college in the first place. But if you actually graduate, then you have a much higher expected wages. It's not like you only learn, finally learn something that transforms your human capital in the last six weeks of college. Obviously, you're going to be learning on the way. And if anything, you'd expect the first two years to have a much higher effect on your human capital than the last two years. But what you find is that people who don't who quit college at any point, doesn't really matter when, get basically the same lifetime income as people who, who just never went in the first place. So that's a sheepskin effect. You might know the book Academically Adrift by Aramin Roxa, and there's a bunch of other books like this that try to test how much do students actually learn? And most of them say they don't learn much of anything, right? So Aramin Roxa say, uh, using something called the collegiate assessment exam, where they take students on day one, a year in, two years in, and so on, and they test a bunch of skills, quantitative reasoning, and so on, uh, analytical reasoning, verbal ability, mathematical ability, et cetera, et cetera. They ask them to like, you know, see how good they are. And uh, they find the bottom 50% of students have no gains. The next 40% of students have maybe um, about like half a standard deviation of gains. And only the top 10% of students have high gains. And they say, by the way, this is true. They used a di number of different universities. And one of their test universities was an Ivy League. Um, they didn't say which one. And even at the Ivy League school, only about 10% of students had significant gains over the course of the first two years of college and by the end. Worse, uh, there's evidence that students don't even transfer learning elsewhere, and I'll probably get into that more later. So, you know, when you, you probably have all heard this before, but when you ask why do students make more money when they graduate, the human capital model of, of education says, 
that, edu you know, we mold our students into more productive people. We teach them how to think and how to talk, how to reason, how to socialize. We improve their productivity. And of course, in a market, workers approximately are going to get their marginal product of labor. So if we make their marginal product of labor higher by developing their human capital, they'll get paid more. That's what we put on the brochures. But the signaling model says, well, really, it's just you're showing your smart, persevering conformist. Yeah, Judson, so what do you want to say? Yeah, just a question. How much of some of these things vary by major? Uh, we don't hear you. So, Maybe yeah, come on, actually, for some of the things, for example, I'm at UCLA and uh, our highest paid undergrads are engineering majors. And I don't know that somebody could go be you know, an electrical engineer without going through a program. And so in that sense, but that probably explains a lot of their salary premium. And then, you know, people that study, I don't know, like gender studies or something like that, maybe don't make so much. Yeah. Uh, so, but there is a lot of variation by major. Oh, oh, absolutely. But even then, a lot of it seems to have something to do with signaling. Uh, so for one, think of how much they do in engineering that has the, the skills they won't actually use on the job. Think about how much selection effect there is to get into engineering. Think about how much they get taught on the job versus like what they actually learn in their classes. You know, like, did you need to take a CAD class? Did you need to take differential equations? Did you need, you know, so a lot of it is just this extra stuff. Think about, uh, you know, the, the typical person who chooses to engineer and uh, to be an engineering major is probably a lot higher IQ than the person who chooses to do something easier. And so we have things like at, when I was at Brown, uh, to my surprise, when I got there, they had an engineering school. I don't know if you know that they, they do. And the mo one of the most common jobs for them was to go work on Wall Street as a finance person. And they would say, look, yeah, you have a chemical engineering degree um, and you don't know anything about finance, but we know you're smart. We know that you work hard. We know that you can stick to something and we know you're good at math. So um, we're just going to hire you and we'll teach you finance in six weeks and then you'll be a consultant. And these people get the same jobs that my students in the business school are getting now. So yes, I do think uh, there, you know, there may be certain jobs where they are getting higher human capital. There's going to be variation here. Um, and this, the wage differences might partly explain that. But you still, even the engineering majors, for the most part, with maybe the exception of computer science, um, if you drop out, you don't get the premium. Like, so, you know, you're three and a half years in of your engineering degree and you quit right? Compared to someone who like finishes it, that person, one person gets the job and the other yeah. doesn't. Yeah, John. So one, one thing though on the dropout though, I mean, that does have its own selection effect. Right. You know, someone, somebody that quits before finishing a task for their degree, they might just be somebody who just doesn't see things through. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's later on. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll well, that's that. part, that's partly a selection issue, or, right? It's a, partly the signaling model. Oh, the fact that you dropped out tells us something about who you are. But presumably your skills, like we can look at your grades. So imagine like you you have a you have a like a 4.0 GPA and you drop out, right? And you're like, oh, my mom died and I couldn't finish going. But you still don't get the job, right? That's what's weird. Uh, John, what do you think? Yeah. So first of all, there is there are differences. The college premium is about double. That is, a person who graduates from college makes about twice as much in their lifetime as a person who. Who doesn't? People who have partial college, that is, drop out, get about 1.5. So, so you're not right that they don't get anything above what high school graduates uh, get. They actually do get a college premium. It's just not a, as large. As far as the differences between professions and excuse me between majors, it does vary between majors. It also varies between professions. The interesting thing is that there's a college premium for every major, for every profession, uh, and you know they they vary. So psychology is very bad as far as the the college premium, uh, whereas uh, engineering is very good, but economics is very good. But there is a college premium, and there's a college premium for every uh, uh, form of employment. So if you are a stock clerk. And you have a college degree, you will be paid more. Yeah, makes no sense from you know it's not signaling. That's that's not signaling. Something weird is going on. If you are a, uh, the only things you don't get paid more for is if you are in a, uh, if you're a mail delivery person, because though the, there the the uh, salaries are absolute are fixed by the civil service laws. So there's something interesting going on, and it can't be explained by by merely signaling, uh, you know, the students that get into Stanford, Harvard, Yale, first of all, they've gotten in, there's a big signal there. 
99% of them are going to graduate. So the smart companies should be hiring them the moment they get admitted because yeah. they've got all the signal they need. They know these people are going to finish. They know, they know that these people got in, but they don't. Companies don't hire immediately after admission. The only place where you do see that is in athletics where um, we can't, colleges don't do anything for athletes, for you know anything that the pro teams couldn't do. So it's not as if we train our, you know, we're so good at training the football players that the NFL couldn't train them just as well. What you see in the, in athletics is that for every every sport, immediately as soon as the sport allows recruitment, our students get recruited away because they don't care. You know, they don't care about the college part. They just want to get the talent. So that's what we should be seeing for our academic students, but we don't. Yeah. Now, there's something weird about that and something that you're not explaining. I mean, you're, I think yeah. I know what it is, but... Well, let me let me let me let me make it actually a little bit more precise then. I do what you think, and then we'll get to the other two people. So uh, I'm going to argue in a second that a lot of what students care about are things like networking and socialization. Because when we say we're building their human capital, we could mean the things we teach in class and the reasoning skills that we supposedly teach in class. We're building that, and that's why they make more money. And then we have the problem of, you know, it's one thing you're talking about a place like Yale where 90 percent of people graduate, and then other schools you might say, well, the school needs to see whether you're actually going to graduate because that tells them something about you, and we don't know that ahead of time. Um, but then even at places like these Ivy League schools, when they do the CLA and other kinds of tests, you get, we try to measure, have you actually learned anything? We get, and for these things, we get an answer, no. Even if you try to pay them, like, uh, like get the, get do well on the test, we'll give you some extra money. They don't seem to do that well on them. Um, however, it could be there is human capital. The CLA, so the, the CLA is, is actually not a very good test. And, yeah. and the, Aram, the Aram and Roxa book is, is really an embarrassing, statistically embarrassing uh, piece of work. I'd be happy to send you a, a refutation of it that I wrote. Yeah, maybe I'd be happy to look at it. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should be less cynical. Uh, yeah, so that's like one of the questions, because it could be the other stuff about socialization is human capital in the technical sense, um, and that's what's doing it. But it could be they're so, actually... So the, just the bottom line of the, some of the points that I've made, and I could, I could argue at more length, if you believe that colleges are not providing any kind of change to the individuals then what you have to believe is that the entirety of the commercial sector in the United States and all over the world are just fools. Yeah. Fools because they're paying extra for no good reason. They should be recruiting these kids as soon as they le can legally recruit them. Um, and, and yet that's not what happens. So yeah. to explain the college premium without believing that college is doing anything, you I don't know how you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Because it, it's one thing if we say, all right, we were talking about say the University of New Hampshire, a lot of people aren't going to graduate. So we want to select, we we don't know on the day that they start whether they have what it takes to graduate. But at the at most elite schools, we do know they have what it takes to graduate. So why bother wait? Yeah, that's a good point. All right, uh, Burke and then David. You're muted, Jonathan. Jason, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, this is very, very brief, but I cannot let you keep saying this because overall the talk has really been good and really been careful about, uh, about selection. The sheepskin effect is ridiculous. Anybody who chooses with only one month to go not to get the degree, given yeah. the enormous benefits of doing that, has some deep psychological problem that's going to overpower anything else in that study. So I think that just using that stuff is ridiculous. Sorry. That's yeah. what well, that's a cartoon way of putting it. What I really mean is something like you would probably, I don't have a graph with me, but if I, had a, if I had a, if I could draw, I'd say something like you might expect human capital goes, I'm not doing this the right way for your view. Human capital goes up like this or something, or perhaps like that. Like there's a human capital development term curve over college. And then when you try to look at, uh, how much money you make based upon how long you go, it doesn't seem to track that. 
right? So that's something about the fact that you're the kind of person who's dropping out. Well, maybe you didn't develop your human capital as much. And then, you know, there are some papers that try to say, well, how much, if you look at a person who has a negative external shock, because if you just look at all the people who drop out, a lot of those are going to be the worst students. But you look for people who have like negative external shocks, like you dropped out because uh, your mom died and you ran out of money. And I dropped out because I slacked off and drank too much. Well, you're actually a good student. You probably learned a bunch, but you, but the schools are like, you know, uh, employers are hard up to like figure out that's what's going on with you. And so your income doesn't seem to go mm-hmm. up. No, because there's a huge economic incentive to stay. So even if your mother dies, the people who choose not to do that, there's something wrong. I mean, you can't use that. But the rest of the evidence are completely a buyer. I mean, you know, I don't want, it's just a small point. Yeah. All right, David, what do you think? Yeah, first of all, it's a great talk, as as I always expect from you. Um, and I've just got an anomaly I've been thinking about in this context that I, I probably should ask our mutual friend, Brian Kaplan, because, of course, he's written a whole book about this. And I keep forgetting to. But anyway, here's the thing. I had a colleague at the Naval Post Graduate School whose daughter uh, didn't go to college, joined the Navy. So that shows some kind of persistence lasting four years in the Navy, got a job locally, worked her way up. And I don't want to say too much to help identify, worked her way up to a certain level and she was doing great. And they had this next level management job. And her employer said, look, we really want to put you in that job, but you've got to go get a degree. And so they've known her for five years. They know what she can do. She, they know she can persist. They know the Navy background. I, that's an anomaly I just always have wondered about. Any, any, And I know it's kind of a side issue, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, I, I think that happened to my brother, too. Like, he enlisted in the military, and he had to go get – and it was basically a fake degree from a fake online school, but they still <laughs> require that. And sometimes I think it's like, well, you just have a policy at particular institutions. You only hire people with degrees. And as a manager, you can't overcome that. Like, even – even at yeah. Georgetown, I don't have, we're hiring tenure track right now, like next month, our job search closes. And uh, I don't have power to hire someone who only has a master's degree. So like if Alistair McIntyre applied for the job, we wouldn't hire him, even though he's a tenured professor, or he just retired, a tenured professor at Notre Dame, because he got in back in the old rules. Mm. Um, yeah. So there might okay. be things like, but then there's a question of why they have that rule in the first place. Yeah. So another worry. But I guess is, it is true that they could just not trust people not to take advantage of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So one okay. other word, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of finish the negative case and then get to the positive case. So the negative case is just saying, let me don't really learn that much. Maybe we're not doing what we think we do. And that's not what students want. There's a big literature on transfer of learning to claim that if you learn a skill in one domain, you, you will spontaneously apply that to other domains to which it could apply. And that's a really large literature. And it's been going on for 100 years. And overwhelmingly, it says students do not engage in transfer of learning. Even high IQ students don't. So like in an econ class, you might be like, Here's supply and demand analysis. We're talking about the price of bananas, but hey, kids, you can use this to understand the dating market. And it's true that you can, or, you know, you've read Gabriel Garcia Marquez's hundred years of solitude. You write an essay on it. Hey kids, that can help you become a better business memo writer. But a lot of educational psychologists can say overwhelmingly educational psychologists claim that for most people, regardless of IQ, learning is highly compartmentalized and you don't spontaneously transfer a skill from one area to another. You don't even when you're prompted. You know, and there's a bunch of experiments where people try this out. Like one of my favorite ones takes place at Arizona State. It uses chemistry and physics majors and that, that who are seniors. And they've spent four years engaging in really complex scientific reasoning. And they, they basically want to score them. How well do you do on a simple problem? And the, one of the problems is something like this. Uh, we, they ask these students, uh, we have a number of students who come into the student health services, mental health services, claiming that not only are they having mental health symptoms, but they're not eating very much. Does it follow that if they ate better, their symptoms would abate and their mental health would get better? So they had a zero to four scoring system and they expected, they, ahead of time, they expected the average score to be like about 2.5 or so or whatever. And it ended up being like about a 0.5 because the typical student who was really good at physics just said, yeah, it couldn't hurt to eat better. You know, what they're supposed to say is, no, there could be a common cause. It could be that the mental health problems are causing the lack of eating. It could be there's a common cause. It doesn't follow that if you ate better, that your mental health would get better. They should have said that they didn't. And they again, another other softball problems. But when they gave them the equivalent problems, structurally identical problem in chemistry and physics, they were able to do it. Or there's a set of experiments about memorization tasks where it would turn out you could teach people to memorize strings of letters, but then they wouldn't be any better at memorizing strings of numbers. Yeah, Dorian. 
<clears throat> that's really an uh, incredible piece of data. And it made me think of my colleagues when they talk about DEI. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, they don't know anything that they know the next day when we're looking at, at a slide in a lecture. So I think it could be uh, an interesting thing to write something about or take somewhere. Yeah, I, I think people in general, they're very compartmentalized and in, in not only in like their knowledge, but also their beliefs. Because you think about like, you know, I'm a philosopher by training. Most of what I do is philosophy. And uh, a lot of what philosophers do is just this. They're like, hey, reader, you believe this, right? And they're like, yeah, you also believe this. Yeah. Do you notice you can't believe both of those things at the same time? And then people are like, here's some hemlock, right? Like, I hate you. Here's some hemlock. Uh you know, really all philosophy has is like consistency tests. But in reality, a lot of people, not only they compartmentalize their learning, they compartmentalize their beliefs. And I'm, I'm sure that explains a lot of like inconsistency here. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. So this is maybe the, some of this is overblown. Maybe some of the data is wrong. Maybe, may, you know, there's a lot of debate about to what degree college premiums come from signaling and what degree they come from uh, human capital. You know, if I had to if I had to put money on it, I would say it's it's majority signaling and minor and minority human capital. But I think even the people who think it's mostly human capital don't say it's 100. percent So we're we're debating like what percent is what. We most people think it's it's both, but what's the actual mix? Um, and then some of this other stuff is pretty disturbing. There's some tests that just like kind of try to review how much students remember uh, from college of particular knowledge, and generally they say that they remember only about 20. percent But then the skill stuff is harder to test. What do students actually want though? When we act, like, what does it seem like they're really into? Here's some type hypotheses, and we don't have surveys indicating this really, but it's just it seems plausibly true. So I'm just going to push this out there. You know, again, this is this is a discussion. It's not a paper in a sense. I'm not trying to get this in the American Economic Review, so I, I'm going to excuse myself for not being super precise and being uh, really anecdotal. Um, I think a lot of what students want when they go to college are the other student body. Like a lot of what they're buying is is the student body. These are future business partners. They're people they're going to go to school, with, like other schools with. These are the people that are going to be friends. They're going to like fall in love with them. They might marry them. They're going to have lifelong friends from this group. And a lot of what the school is saying is, hey, students, like if you come to Stanford, we have selected this really interesting and impressive student body for you to be friends with and to marry and interact with and to interact with years from now. Plus, we have this really interesting student alumni alumni network that will consider hiring you and like you'll be able to talk to people because you went to Stanford. You'll get networking skills. We're also going to do a different kind of human capital development, which is to socialize you, especially for elite universities, when elite universities are where, are where the legacy stuff really matters. Um, we're going to socialize you into the mores and the tastes and the way of speaking and the mannerisms and the types of vacations that the upper middle to upper class takes. We're going to teach you how to be an elite sort of person, right? We're, that's a lot of what we're doing while you're here. Think about how much highfalutin nonsense we do in our writing. And, but nevertheless, you get these sort of designer beliefs and designer modes of talking that sort of signal that you're the right kind of person. You know, wearing a Stanford shirt tells people something about you in the same way that wearing a Swiss watch tells something about you. Being able to talk like a person who went to Stanford tells people something about you. Having friends who went to Stanford tells people something about you. Further, there's a culture at different schools that people are interested in. They, they want to go to that school for that culture. I, I used to work at Brown and, you know, Brown's a, is a cool school. I actually think there's a lot to be said on behalf. Now that I left, I realized I think it's a quite good school in ways I didn't appreciate when I was there. But um, we also would often joke like, why do so many people pick Brown over Cornell or Dartmouth or like Columbia? I mean, they don't pick us over, over Harvard, but why would they pick us over these other schools? Like, what do we have that they don't? They have more money. They have more faculty. They often have bigger campuses. Like, what do we have? And there's a particular kind of culture that people enjoy at Brown. They're going there for that reason. We're also selling students prestige. You know, having a degree is a prestigious thing, especially from a prestigious school. It tells people something about you. It tells, it changes who's willing to like hire you and marry you and things like that. Uh, who's willing to talk to you at a bar, how people react to you when you're walking down the street. You know, just things like if I'm walking around my neighborhood, I mean, everyone knows me now, but when I first started walking around my neighborhood with my dog. I wear a Georgetown shirt and people would come up and go, oh, you, you Georgetown, what's, what's that about? I'm a professor there. Oh, you must be really smart or something. Okay, great. Like you get that kind of benefit um, from having this and people are more likely, you know, so if you, if you go to a place like Harvard, a nice thing that happens is when you decide to have a spouse later on, you're more likely to get someone who's the equivalent of a Harvard grad. And those people are very desirable. Do students 
actually want to attend schools where all that matters for admissions are grades and SAT scores. You know, there are some universities that are kind of close to that, but is that the place where people want to go? Imagine you've got a place like, you know, your typical elite school now where these things are matter. They're part of the cutoff, but they're not all that matters. We also look for things like how interesting you are and what things you've done in your life and what your dreams are and who you are and your social skills. And so we have elite, intellectually elite students, plus all this other stuff versus literally just picking the most intellectually elite students and ignoring it. I bet most students who go to Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, Cornell, et cetera, would rather go to the first kind of school where they're surrounded by intellectual elites who also have other things. And maybe that reduces the intellectual elitism to some degree versus just literally let's only take students with 1600s on the SAT and 4.5 GPAs, et cetera. Um, I think they'd rather go there because they want, because of these reasons, they care about this stuff. And further, um, some, again, anecdotal, not hard data about this is to think about what happened during the Zoom years when we were, when we had COVID, you know, student learning took a hit, but not as, at least at the college level, not as big of a hit as we might have thought, but students were extremely dissatisfied and really unhappy with their colleges because what they really missed was the communal experience of living together with other students, socializing with them, networking with them, and so on. So yeah, they learned less, but they also lost to the social stuff. And that's why they're so upset. You know, I mean, I know, I know at, like at our university, for instance, that students who are away for that year and a half when we canceled classes uh, and did it all via Zoom, they're, they're already saying like, we're not giving money to the school, their parents are upset, et cetera. And think about what, how this affects what, how elite universities determine admissions. It seems like elite universities agree with this philosophy. It seems like the students accept it. And it seems like elite universities admissions offices also accept it. Because otherwise, it'd be hard to explain a lot of else what else they throw in. So we have all that DEI stuff, right? Which a lot of that is about, in principle, about creating a diverse and interesting student body, right? There's this argument, for instance, that uh, cognitive diversity will lead to like better group decision making and so on. And granted, they don't really look for cognitive diversity; they look for racial diversity. But that's the argument that they make. Think about how universities care a lot about extracurriculars. Uh, they don't just want to show that you're a high achieving person, but they like they select on purpose a well-rounded body. It's like, we want somebody who's really good at horseback riding and someone who's really good at guitar and someone who likes to climb mountains and a person who started a business when they were 14 and a person who did a lot of like social justice volunteering and a person who was in the military. Like they look to try to create a student body that's rounded where for every kind of interesting skill and background, they've got people who represent those things. Ex university uh, admissions officers explicitly do this. If you ask them, they say, if you read books about what they do, they all say the same thing. They're trying to do that. And that often determines who gets in. You get in and not this person because it turns out we know we want a saxophone player this year for our student orchestra. So that's why you're in and not someone else. They try to get people from as many countries as possible. They try to get at least one student from every state. So, hey, our one kid from Alaska is graduating. You're the best Alaskan applicant this year. You're in. Like if they if they all they cared about SAT scores and things, they wouldn't do that. They allow uh, faculty kids in more easily. I don't know if that's true for you guys, but um, at least at Brown and Georgetown, it's a open secret that um, faculties when faculty's children apply. They have to meet a cutoff, but they're much more likely to be accepted than comparable students elsewhere, even superior students on paper. They care about things like students who share the student. A quick culture. question of, to clarify, faculty kids from that faculty or any faculty? No, from that faculty in particular. Okay, thanks. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, yeah. So it's like at Brown, where did all the faculty's kids, where do they all go to school? And it's like, oh, 90%. I don't know if the actual, actual number's on my head, but it was a it was a super majority of them, their kids go to Brown, right? Uh, as opposed to some other equally good university. And it wasn't even because they had a particularly good deal on tuition. They didn't. It was like really, the discount was really crappy, actually. It wasn't enough to like change your mind. Uh, they care about things like students who get the school and have the same kind of mores and culture and who also share the ideology of the admissions officer. I mean, they make you kind of push that, right? So I think we really think about it like student universities are these kind of left-wing places in terms of their expression, but their actual function appears to be pretty right-wing. We have all these jobs and things out there that people want, where in order to get them, you need to have a university degree. We create and maintain a status distinction. We gatekeep and we look to have people like this. And students want that stuff. Yeah, Dorian, what do you think? I, I'm more uh, cynical than you, maybe. I think all those things you just listed are just a magician's trick so that they can end up picking whoever they want to admit for other reasons. 
and keeping yeah. the whole scheme going, which is mostly legacy and do donor and things. Cause what they really care about is the money. So I don't think they actually believe any of that stuff makes the class more interesting. They just say it because that yeah. way the whole system's confusing and then they can do whatever they want. You might be right. And I'm, I'm definitely not one who I want to like try to save universities by arguing too hard against you. But then if you were right, I wonder why don't they have an even higher take of, of legacy people? Why don't they have an even higher take of high income people? Why do they, do, are they really admitting like, I, I know they have to protect their public reputation. They have yeah, to look that's what I would say. Um, Could they, are they really like optimizing for that? Like how much can I get away with? Uh, oh, I have to admit 10% poor students, uh, but, or could it be like 8% or 6%? Yeah, John. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that for, for all universities, but I do for Stanford. The, um, the legacy admission is about twice the percentage of admits as the general population. So, so we admit 4% of the applicants. Legacies, uh, we admit 8% of them. Now, some of that's go going to be explained by the fact that they're smart kids. You know, they've had good upbringings because their parents were Stanford graduates and so forth. Part of it is, is indeed, you're absolutely right. Part of it is a legacy preference. And there are reasons for that, that and you've touched upon a number of them. Um, now, faculty, it's actually is the highest percentage. So they have the most chance, faculty kids have the highest chance of getting in of any, uh, any group. And, and that's about three times. So it's maybe 12%, 15%, something of that sort. Um, so, so we do, you know, we do have these preferences, but don't for, you know, don't think for a minute that 80% of the alumni are getting in or that, you know, some extremely high percentage of, uh, of children of, of faculty are getting in. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. Um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, and I think the more hard it is, the more difficult it is to get in, like the less you're going to have that number. It makes sense that way. Uh, so the, the question here, though, to go with like Dorian was saying was, um, if imagine universities were just, they, they just want to admit people for a bunch of other reasons that are completely hidden to us and that are kind of snotty and bad and elitist, we might expect the numbers to be different from what we see. We see a pretty high admission rate for legacy students. It's that's significantly higher than other students, even higher than other students who are equal quality, because we can look at what happens to Stanford legacies when they apply to Harvard or Princeton, and they do better at Stanford, right? But right. We, if it were really, really bad, we'd expect the numbers to be different. So I no, think there, there definitely is a legacy preference, no yeah. question about it. So I think a lot of what's happening is the schools are saying like, we, we are Harvard and Harvard has an identity and a culture and an elite norms. And you, when you come here, we're gonna help you become that kind of person. And one of the things we have to do to help you do that is to make sure that we have other Harvard legacy students come in. We have these are kids who grew up with Harvard parents and who know a lot about Harvard and care about it a certain way that might be different from the rest of you who are newcomers. And we're having this kind of revolving thing with families over time, especially considering these kids are more likely to have other kinds of elite mores, elite norms, and so on. We're selecting for that to help reinforce the student body being a certain way so that the rest of you, when you come in, you get the thing you want, which is the socialization and the elitism and the introduction to that kind of thing. So I think in a way, I think what they're basically doing is in the same way that it makes sense for a university to say, well, we're selling you a student body and you probably want to go to a school where you have people who are good at all sorts of different kinds of things. And that's why we let in the tuba player over um, maybe someone who's more impressive that did something we already have 10 of, like a crew player or something like that. In the same way, I think they're saying, well, you want us to be elite, and that means we're going to let in legacy students at a higher rate because that makes the experience for you who we do let in better. And it's kind of like the students who are rejected in favor of a legacy student, they're probably upset about that. But the students who are admitted, in a way, they're probably benefiting from having those legacy students there, given the cynical thing I think they want. I mean, it's maybe not that cynical to say they want this stuff. Right? Could I get a Go quick ahead. one? Yeah. I think a, a test of Dorian's kind of cynicism about that would be, say, on the one from every state, see if they do have one from every state. I mean, that's one, because places like Alaska and Rhode Island and Wyoming and Montana, that's going to be a real test. And then I have a clarification question for John. When you said it's three times for the faculty kids, you said 12%, but what's the percentage of? Uh, of? Of applicants. And and I may be wrong about 
about four okay. times. It's what I, do, what I do know is that it's the okay. highest um, it's the highest percentage of, of okay. any of these groups. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So wait, you say twelve percent of applicants. You mean the acceptance? If if I'm a faculty member at Stanford at a randomly selected one, I can expect my kid to have a twelve percent acceptance rate, or right. averaging it out, it works out to be right. 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 Yeah. And it's that's in the ballpark. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Which is still an amazing bonus. I mean, given how hard it is to get in, imagine imagine what these students would pay. Uh, if you could tell a typical student you could pay to have twice as good of a chance of getting in, I bet they'd pay tens of thousands of dollars for that, even though they'd probably still get rejected. So yeah, so this is ultimately the argument. Jason, um, yeah, go ahead. So let me say, you know, a lot, I, I agree with most of what you're saying that that these are benefits that are that are provided to to the students. They are they are brought into a community. That yeah. community is a is an elite community, and that helps those students. That's part of what we give them is connections, uh, and you know, part of what we give them is is um, I do think part of what we give them is an education, and I, but I'd have it'd take me too long to explain why. I don't think it's a it's a bunch of information. I could care less about whether or not graduates can still do their calculus final that they could do when they were sophomores when they graduate. That makes no difference whatsoever. I don't care if they can pass the test that they passed in their U.S. history course uh, when they graduate. That makes absolutely no difference. Um, that doesn't mean we're not educating them. Yeah, and I could explain what I what I mean by that. But yeah, um, but they, I think the thing that we, you need to focus on is the college premium, and this is the interesting point that the college premium, even if you go to a non elite college, you get a college premium, you yeah. will get paid more, and uh, and whatever kind of job you go into, you will get paid more. In, unless you're a, a letter carrier, <laughs> uh, whatever kind of major you take, in general, you will you will get paid more, and and that's all bizarre. And there's to explain it, we have to rethink what we mean by education. Why is that occurring? Yeah, it is occurring. Why is that occurring? It's not because all of the employers in the in the country are just stupid, right? If they could get a cheaper product, if they could get cheaper employees who are just as good by hiring immediately after high school, they get, you know, four extra years of, of employment for them and, and they get them for cheaper. Why don't they do that? Right. I mean, again, I say, I agree with you that it's puzzling. If you know that a particular school has a 99% accept, uh, finishing rate, graduation rate, then the signaling wall has a hard time explaining why those people don't get hired right away. Uh, it does better on other universities that have lower rates where it's like we really, you know, the fact that you're admitted to the University of Michigan or the University of New Hampshire or West Virginia University is a signal that you are that you are higher IQ. It's a signal that you're better than others, but it's not a very good signal yet because we still want to know if you're a perseverant smart person. Right. And then we need to see if you finish the hoop jumping. Maybe the hoop jumping thing doesn't matter as much for Yale or Stanford because it's just a given that you will. Um, so you're right. It would be we'd expect these uh, places just to hire them right afterwards, but maybe not the rest of the uh, rest of academia after you get past like the, the top like twenty or thirty. Yeah, graduation um, is an additional sig signal. Yeah. That's right. But That's right. you know, but, uh, the best... but even then, a lot of what we're we, you and I might disagree about some of these things, and you might be right. Uh, you wrote, you know, you're, you've written papers on this uh, that are very sophisticated, and I'm not going to challenge you and say that you're wrong. But I, but you know, the main thing here is like. Uh, um, I think the argument that people make against legacy admissions is this thing like it's anti-meritocratic. That means it's unethical. It's bad business ethics. You say you're admitting on the basis of merit, but legacy is not a form of merit. And therefore you're screwing over the students who are who fail to get in because they're not legacies. You're screwing over those students in this really unethical and unfair way. And then this is effectively saying, and I might be too cynical about how much they learn, and that makes the argument weaker, but I think what I'm really trying to say is, I don't think that's really true. I think what we're actually doing is we admit legacy students because that improves the student body according to the preferences of the people who come to our schools. They want to be at the kind of school that has the things that legacies provide to that school. So we're actually improving our product on their behalf. And I understand that Yes, I would much rather, you know, if I were applying to like a fancy school, I'd much rather that they admit me than a legacy because I want to be there. 
But once I'm there, the people who are there want to be at the school with these places because they bring a lot to the table, right? And then that I think changes the business ethics of it. But I, th I think the place to look, I mean, I agree with all, all of that. Uh, but the play, one place to look is at international students, undergraduate international students, and they come disproportionately from the very highest incomes in their respective co countries. You know, so you you right. get the the really really wealthy Indian students, who really well, and so forth and so on. Now, is that is that a problem? Well, if you think that what we're doing is in part providing benefits to our undergraduates. It is a huge benefit for them to be able to get to know, uh, you know, Ambani versus uh, some somebody who has just, um, you know, barely made it through high school in India. So we are giving the rest of the students a huge benefit uh, by that. Yeah, and and that's an example of the same thing. Legacy sim similarly. Yeah, I agree. And someone like Michael Sundell would say, oh, no, the reason we, we admit these foreign students who are rich is because they pay full tuition. We don't give them financial aid. And then they subsidize the American students who aren't as rich. And that's true. Oh, there's some of that. Yeah. But but as you're saying, it's like, well, there's actually the students who go there also want to meet that student. They'd rather interact with the rich person from India who has amazing network in India than a poor student from India who has none. That's a benefit. Right? So I agree. Uh, Ivan, what do you think? Yeah, no, I have a question for you, or maybe also for John. Are you aware, or do you do you know any data on whether you know students who major, say, in grievance studies, do get a a sort of college premium? Because that's an example where I think the university is not really transforming them, or if it is, if it is transforming them, probably transforming them in a negative way. So there's where I think there would be potentially sort of a market failure because, you know, it, you, you admit them to, to Stanford and, uh, but then, you know, they, they go into these, uh, you know, programs that are, I think, counterproductive, right, for them. Uh, but, but, that, but the market doesn't respond to that by hiring before they get injured, so to speak, right? So going back to John's, John's, uh, <clears throat> comment about the college premium. So do, do you have any data on that? I know, I don't have a study on that. I know of a of work that one of my friends did and he never tried to publish it, where he, he was very upset that his particular, I, I probably shouldn't say which one, his particular um, elite liberal art college, like on par with like an Amherst or a Williams kind of place, uh, had this thing where kept pushing minority students who major in the study of their minority, you know, the mm -hmm. your grievance study for your minority. And he was really pissed about this because he thought it was like causing them to lose chances to get better jobs. And he did collect data on that and basically said, well, granted their selection, but uh, it looks like the black student who majors in African-American studies does worse than an otherwise equivalent black student who majors in economics. But he never tried to publish it. He was just trying to do this to like change the, uh, the behavior of the school itself. And then he retired. Um, that's the only thing off the top of my head that I know of. Um, I don't, I don't know if there is a study out there about how grievance studies majors do. Does anyone else know? Yeah, maybe it might be the kind of thing too, where uh, if you did have a paper like that, it'd be difficult to publish it because uh, there's the answer and then there's, and the answer might be impolite and people don't want to have their, they don't want their journal to take up space on this impolite answer. We know what happens when you do that, people come after you and there's all sorts of other interesting stuff to publish. So why publish that? I actually read some time ago, I vaguely remember I read an article, maybe in the Wall Street Journal, arguing that, uh, you know, a grievance study degree at Harvard uh, had a sort of negative MPV. Uh, yeah. That's the only thing I heard. Yeah, you can imagine that it's a pretty strong signal of what kind of person you're going to be, uh, and that would dissuade people from hiring you, except for certain kinds of activist jobs. You know, if I were, I'm, I'm, I'm married, but if someone were sitting, setting me up and they're like, oh, do you want to meet my friend? Uh, she has a PhD in English. I'd be like, no, probably not. Because like, I have, I really don't like English as a field, right? I know I like English what it studies, but I don't like English professors in general. Uh, so they're like, oh, she has a degree in grievance studies. I'm like, for, we're not going to get along. She's going to think that my ideology is completely evil. And I'm probably going to think hers is pretty evil too. So uh, I'll just probably be a little bit nicer about it than she is. So yeah, you can understand that someone who's been trained to do 
angry activism for four years might not fit in well at Goldman Sachs. Mm. So I, I would be surprised if there wasn't a negative, some sort of negative effect, but I, I don't know if there's a paper on it. I wonder what else, um, you know, because I said like this, the point of this thing was Ivan was talking, does anyone defend legacy admissions? And I was like, I got a brief thing about it in a book and I have some things, and this is even more expansive than what the book says. You know, I think legacy students are the product we are selling. They they are a product that universities sell to other students and they enhance the rest of the product that universities sell. So that takes away many of the complaints. Um, but what else? What do you guys think? Is more to be said for and against? Let me let me throw something out. Yeah. It's, so you, in, in some ways, it's tendentious the way you're describing this, right? What yeah. part part of what we're selling is is to the other students is the legacy students, and and that sounds I don't know slimy or something. Um, I think what part of what we're selling is is a community yeah. and a loyal community and a community that you know if you're a Stanford graduate, this other Stanford graduate who's never met you, who's 30 years older than you are, you know, actually helps you in, in your career. So that is part of what we're selling. And the fact is, and, and here's, I'll tell you an anecdotal story. The, the alumni who's, there's nothing that will, uh, that will spoil a, a, an alumni's relationship with the university quite like denying their child admission. Yeah. And I'm, I was a legacy applicant to Stanford and, um, and I was turned down. I was not accepted. My mother wrote off the university for whatever, 30 years until I became provost. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said to do. So oh, they, and, and I've seen this over and over again. It just hurts, it hurts the people so much when you do not accept their their child so you bend over backwards you know is this person qualified will this person actually do well and so forth and so on and and that's part of a way of keeping you know maintaining the uh, integrity or the the whatever the the sense of the community the, the stanford community yeah yeah that's a good point and i'll get to uh the other john in a second um uh, anecdotally to my one of my colleagues the guy who has the office across from mine he is a duke graduate two two like three degrees from duke actually a phd a law degree and an undergraduate degree loves duke wears duke t-shirts every day his daughter applies to duke doesn't get in stopped wearing duke t-shirts no more no more money um and you might think too like given given the value of that if you're in a way a lot of what happens with elite universities is you have say tens of thousands of applicants you have a certain number of spots many of the applicants at the top are are roughly equally good it's not like we really know this is the best one it's kind of a crapshoot at that it's like with hiring for faculty too you know if i if we get 500 applicants for faculty when by the time we cut it down to like 15 people that we really take a serious look at and five people we bring to campus the reality is the top 30 are all probably about the same and we think we've optimized we probably haven't but now we have a really good other reason that's extra to pick this person over someone else that matters and talking about continuing the culture matters to the loyalty to the school and what that brings. Think about for sports, multi-generation sports fans. My dad was a Yankees fan. My grandpa was a Yankees fan. I'm a Yankees fan versus someone who's just moved in. It maintains the culture. It maintains the feeling of community. And that's valuable. We should just say that's worse. And what's so bad about that? Why not admit that we're doing that? Yeah, Jason, what, what we see is roughly you get 150 applicants who are so unbelievable that they'll get into any place in the world and they've, they've yeah. achieved, you know, they've played at Carnegie Hall and so forth, whatever. They're, they're absolutely knock your socks off kids. And then we have large numbers of people that are really, really good, really qualified high school graduates who have done all the things that high school students do to get into college. And we could, admit three or four classes randomly from that group and probably have exactly the same quality uh, student mm -hmm. body. And so when you think of that, then it really becomes a matter for that group, you know, that, that group of really excellent, but not superstars. Yeah. It becomes a question of how do you pick the ones you pick? Right. You know, what's gonna, what's gonna make a difference between this 
this person and that person, well, they're all roughly speaking equally qualified. They'll all do very well. And I think the answer to that is by all these other ways, by, by legacy, by, you know, it's this a faculty child and so forth and so on. And it, it's not that we're ignoring merit. It's just that we're using that as a, a, a distinguishing feature. Yeah, I think Anyway, and it's a distinguishing feature that benefits the university. Why, why do I bend over backwards to admit faculty kids? I want to retain my faculty, right? Why do I bend over backwards to admit uh, alumni kids? Well, I, I want the community to, to remain loyal to the university and loyal to our graduates and so forth and so on. It all makes perfect sense. And it's a business model that has worked. And, and the interesting thing about these arguments is now people are saying, uh, your business, we want you to change your business model. And uh, for, for whatever reason, for equity reasons. Um, and I, I mean, I'm tempted to say, you know, you know, this is what we do. This is how we do it. And, uh, you know, don't tell us how to run the university. Yeah, well, I agree with you. That's good. I think if anything, the difference between us is largely just I put it in a sort of cynical spin and you put an optimistic spin on it. So uh, there's a reason why they make, they're making you were a provost. Or are you still a provost? And no. I'm never going to be one because uh, <laughs> you know how to sell it better. Um, I agree. Uh, yeah, John, what do you think? Me, um, first, let me just uh, thank John for all he does on things like this. And that he, you know, John, you keep saying, keep saying this is, a, you know, this is the university and this is how we run it. But I think there's some subtle thing in this discussion that I think we should think more carefully about, which is, you know, as John and as you have discussed, it's basically a club. And there are lots of private clubs with memberships and they let you in and, you know, thing. I think a university is slightly different to that because I think that, Certainly education is not about facts. That test you gave to your students, what you didn't say is you give the same test to your colleagues and they get the same result, yeah. right? So um, it's not about facts. It's not about recollections. So what is education about? It's something to do with interacting with people with different views and not just different views, but interacting with people that set exemplars for you, Right? that you come in with a view of the world or even an ambition of the world, that suddenly it gets blown out the water because you look across the hall and you see somebody do something that you couldn't yourself ever conceive of doing. And you ask yourself, well, why? Why haven't I conceived of doing that? And how do I go? Or some student in class makes a point and it drops in your head and you go, by God, I, didn't, I wasn't thinking like that. And you start changing your thinking. So I think there is this education going on. We're not, we, I mean, the problem with our society is we don't, we don't educate well. We don't even know what we're doing. But there is the sense where we're giving these skills to students, which then transfers into other environments, not directly as a, this problem is another problem, but just the, the approach. And I think that that's something that was worth researching and thinking about. Yeah. I would like to see more, uh, testing of what we do. And I'm not saying I know how to test it. I think it's, you know, I once wrote a critique that I'm more secure about than this, about uh, grading policies and student evaluations of, of teachers and things like that. And I said, look, I can tell you what's wrong with what we do, but if you ask me to try to come up with how would we prove what we're doing is like, how would you really prove that someone's a good teacher? It's like, if we tried to do like random randomized control trials or something like that, like the art, the artifacts and methods we use in other fields, it's way too expensive, way too time consuming and it violates student freedom. So we can't, we just really can't do it. Maybe someone else can come up with something better that we can do. Um, I do wish universities did more to try to prove like what is our value added? Um, how, how much are we really developing these skills? We're very convinced that we are, we have some indirect evidence that we are, um, that has some possible alternative explanations. But we don't we don't hold ourselves to super high standards in evaluating ourselves in the way that we when we point our fingers elsewhere, we hold, say, BMW to very high standards or uh, Pfizer to very high standards. Right. Should we be doing more? Should, I mean, because, you know, you're probably right. But how do we know? So can I throw um, throw out a suggestion? So yeah. think think backwards. 
So think about what these, these kids' careers are going to look like. Every one of them is going to get into some career or other, and they're going to have multiple jobs through their career, unless, you know, unless they, they I don't know, become a carpenter. Um, and so they're going to have to do apply different skills. They're going to have to please different masters. They're going to have to, you know, be very flexible in, in mastering the new job. What do we teach them? Well, we give our students at a, at Stanford 45 classes that they have to take at, at semester places at 30. Each of these are uh, have a, a particular subject that they have to master. They have to demonstrate their mastery using different kinds of outputs like speaking, oral, oral speaking, uh, you know, written communication, tests, and so forth and so on. They have to please different masters. They have to please this faculty member is an asshole. This faculty member is a really easy grader. This faculty member is uh, blah, blah, blah. Right? So we're, we're teaching them how to master all of these different kinds of uh, challenges. Right? We then send them out into the world and they get in a job. And our students, that is graduates of college, have experience doing that. So they move on in their career. They, they, they take another job. They know, I know, you know, it's like my class. I know how to, this guy is, you know, he really likes such and such. This guy is an asshole. And, and here are the skills that I have to use. You master it. And why do you know how to master it? Because we've taught you how to master things, right? That's the key thing that allows you to, um, you know, go up, move up and, and become successful in, in industry. And it doesn't matter what the mastery is. It doesn't matter if you lose the entirety of the information that you gained in this class by the time you, uh, you know, graduate. That's irrelevant. What's relevant is that you're learning how to master different subjects, different environments, different tasks, uh, you know, with, well, I don't know how to finish the sentence. So <laughs> that's what you're learning. That you're not learning calculus. You're not learning the date that so and so happened. Um, so I think that that's the explanation. That explains why the college premium is so significant, and why it applies across the board, not just to elite universities. It, it applies if you go to, you know, Cal State Fullerton. I mean, not uh, as much, but you know. I just want to add quickly, I got enormous pleasure from hearing a provost admit there are some faculty who are assholes. I just want to point, point that out. I was pointing at myself, David. <laughs> I bet that's not true. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they all think it, but they can't say, at least not while they're provost, right? Yeah. Uh, um, I wonder what you think then, uh, you know, about like the Stacey Dale, Alan Kruger papers about... Um, where they're talking like what's the value added of an elite school versus a non-elite school and so they're you know to so oversimplify them like for those of you who haven't heard probably all read the papers but if you those of you who haven't uh it's sort of like you have a student gets into harvard and goes to harvard and you have a student who's admitted to harvard and goes to tulane or goes to uc davis or goes somewhere else and then you look at um long-term outcomes and income and so on and this is overly simplifying it to the point of not being accurate uh you know, about a year out there, the people who actually went to Harvard do better than the people who didn't. And then like after about 10 years, they're doing about the same. It is true that as you get farther and farther away from the very top, you start seeing persistent income effects, but they're not, they're surprisingly small, right? So it's a little bit of like, you know, hey, it's great that you got in, but you don't need to actually go. And so one implication of that could just be, even though the uh, quality of research between uh the difference between like a UMass Amherst, like a UMass Amherst versus UMass Boston versus Harvard. Research-wise, the faculty might be much, much better at one place than the other. Maybe teaching-wise, the experience is roughly the same um, and they're getting the same quality of instruction either way uh, in terms of the things you're talking about. Um, I think that- the, think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the difference really is the the alumni community that, you're, that are out there that will help you uh, start your career. And the important thing is that that is something that is of most benefit at the beginning of your career. 
Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's not particularly, once you've been out for 20 years, your performance swamps everything else. And, and the fact that you, you're a Stanford graduate and you know the Stanford graduate isn't going to get you the job. It really is your performance that's going to matter. Uh, whereas at the beginning of your career, it makes a big difference or it can make a big difference. Yeah. But this I, does seem to suggest that in a way, the quality of education is relatively homogenous between these schools, uh, which you wouldn't expect. You would expect that like the quality of education at like the University of Chicago is much better than at uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. Right? That's That's what I'm wondering about. Um, I don't have a view on that. I'm just wondering about. Yeah, I mean, I think that that has a lot to do with the size of classes. Yeah, Michael, what do you think? Well, I was former chair of the Stanford Alumni Board. We do a lot of research, and John Echemendi's right. Everything, it's largely the shared experience, and it doesn't matter what school you went to. There, it, and it isn't getting jobs. For it's, uh, I'm sorry, in my law firm, hiring and everything else, we could care less where somebody went, but. The shared experience, which we build on while they're still students, very carefully, and then we very much build upon it with the way the alumni events are done. We uh, strategize, we segregate them into the various groups that have common interests, and with AI, God knows what we're going to end up doing, but we do know how to keep building that relationship. And as for alumni children, they may largely accept more often because they have greater comfort of what might be ahead, given the parent or family experiences. Good. Other thoughts? Are you all, uh, are you all on board now? It's okay to have legacy admissions if you weren't before. Maybe you're all on board ahead of time. I am. I'm more so than I was. Okay. Can I point out something else that's, kind of related um i don't you've probably heard of the economist bob tollison right who died a few years ago um yeah. he had a, an article co-authored with someone about 30 years ago in which they looked at when a school did well in sports what was the average sat the next year hmm. of the uh people applying and it was a substantial increase like i don't know 20 30 points something like that yeah. And I just find that interesting. And somehow it might connect in some way with this. I don't know. Yeah, it makes the school more attractive to the people and you get better people, right? Yeah. Ah, if that's an instrument. Yeah. You could use that, right? Here's a randomization. Yeah. School's football record and the subsequent performance of the students afterwards. There should be no, you shouldn't see a relation. If you see a relation or the extent of the relation gives you some measure of the signaling yeah good yeah i mean that's that's a good point someone should i'm not going to do it but some, someone here should write a paper about this like using this point like david you should do that uh, <laughs> um yeah uh mark what do you think is is there a distinction or, or data to draw a distinction between legacy versus um siblings um in that if, like I, I made a comment in the chat that if the goal is, if there's some risk to student success and the goal of the university is among other things to maximize the probability of success of the student, then, um, you know, can you compare legacy admissions versus sibling admissions to say, to, to try to distinguish between the effects. So, you know, you all mentioned these states with no people in them. Um, yeah. And as the Stanford employee living in Montana, I can tell you that, you know, both of my kids went to Northwestern. Um, my daughter was admitted to Northwestern because of probably partially uh, very good performance, but also um, connections. Yeah not legacy connections, but then my son, it would seem very clear that conditional on my daughter's success, the probability of admitting a kid from a high school in Montana where you know nobody has any information about the quality of the education, you can look at this, the, the, the sibling and say, okay, very high probability of success, which 
is, is sort of distinguishing between, you know, purely, you know, a legacy effect versus, you know, call it a genetic endowment. I don't know what you'd call it, but like, is there, is, do you think there's something there in that distinction? I think it's a very good hypothesis. Um, and I think it'd be very hard to test it with available public data. Yeah. And that's really one of the problems when I was like looking into this um, just for the purposes of like talking about it with you guys or briefly talking, but put it talking about it briefly in this book is really about something else. It's like uh, one, one of the issues you have is we're using the universe data that universities themselves collect and they use inconsistent definitions. Like what counts as a legacy? So what counts as a primary versus a secondary legacy and so on? They use they use these words, but they use them slightly differently. So does it have to be a parent? Does it have to be a sibling? And different universities are going to categorize these differently. Um, so even just checking between schools, you can't easily do that. Uh, and then what about things like a current student versus someone who's actually graduated? Are you going to call that a legacy or not if the person's still in school? And if you look at what universities are you calling legacies, that's also inconsistent. So I think if it's a good testable hypothesis, uh, but it, you'd have to basically get your own data so you could characterize things exactly the right way. Um, and who knows? You know, I don't. I don't recall seeing something talking specifically about siblings. They focus mostly focus on parents versus, say, a cousin versus a grandparent, etc. Yeah, but that's a good point. Um, and again, it does make sense. I mean, we do know universities. They're trying to admit people that they expect to succeed. I mean, all things equal, that's that matters. So it does make sense that if if they have some sort of evidence that having two kids at the same school makes it more likely they'll stay, they probably would give that be that would be a thumb on the scale. But are they actually doing it? How much are they doing it? I don't know. Does it actually work? I don't know. You know, that's that's one of the things. It's like even looking at things like how well do how well do legacy students do in school? That well, actually looks like they do pretty well. Uh, in, in as far as there's data about that, how much of that is because of of this factor versus that factor and deciding which legacies get in. I don't know. There's not data out there that's fine grained enough to really test that. You know, so I think someone who really wanted to be scientific and rigorous about this, you'd basically have to like work with a university admissions office, maybe a couple university admissions offices and let them give you lots and lots of data about who applied and who didn't that you can characterize your own way. Okay, more questions? <clears throat> Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Jason. It was a great talk. And next week we'll have uh, Chris Brunet to talk about anonymity and identity online. So uh, everybody is welcome to join us. Thank you, Jason, again. I just Thank sent you. you an article by John and Chimendi uh, related to the talk. So yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks okay. so much, everyone. Have a good one. Thanks, Jason.